Hello friends, my name is Evelyn Joy and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about politics. Feel free to click away if you can't handle the heat. I never thought we'd see the day that we'd be talking about defunding and abolishing the police. Could this actually be good for our country? Let's look at some of the facts that we are seeing today. We've seen video footage that some police officers are corrupt, some of them are even racist. Does that mean that we need to fix the entire system? What should we do to change things? Patrice, I'm going to jump straight in with you. As a co-founder of Black Lives Matter, did you ever think you would see the day when everyone from Amazon to Mitt Romney <laughs> would be proudly proclaiming Black Lives Matter? Explain to me a little bit about what the thinking behind that was. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we looked at the academic literature. There are over 40 years of literature that shows that more restrictive use of force policies can reduce killings by police and police shootings overall, both fatal and non-fatal. Um, we recognize that, you know, these are things that cities can do right now. Uh, immediately, a mayor can do it, a police chief can do it um, as a harm reduction strategy. But I think ultimately, uh, I think where the country is right now is striving for a lot more. It's not just about mm -hmm. harm reduction. It's about how do we actually move towards transformational change that goes beyond changing use of force policies, but includes uh, building alternatives to the police and defunding the police. What does defunding the police mean? Because for some people, what they hear you're saying is, take money away from the police as like a punishment for what they've been doing wrong. Sure, I mean, I really think about it pretty simply, which is what are the things the police are doing right now that can actually be given over to other groups of people, other workers who've been trained to do that particular thing. So we can uh -huh. just start off with homelessness. Police are at the helm of criminalizing the homeless. Um, we don't need them to be at the helm of criminalizing the homeless. We need mayors and county government to actually show up and put dollars and money towards people who are um, homeless and giving them housing and shelter. Um, what about people who have mental health crisis? Why are the police the first responders? Um, this is not actually a job for a police officer. It's a job for a social worker, a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. All this infrastructure is essentially gutted and communities that I live in and communities around the country. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening though, is they're replaced with um, over bloated police budgets. And so you look at Los Angeles where I'm from, which our LAPD department actually receives 54% of the city's budget, meaning that everything else that a community needs, they're not receiving, but they are receiving a gun and a badge. And that is deeply unfortunate. Movement basically designed to de-escalate police violence by, in some cases, replacing police with community advocates. But there's a serious debate tonight over whether this approach can work. <laughs> it's been a rallying cry since the police killing of George Floyd. Protesters, activists, and some city officials calling for police departments across the U.S. to be defunded. It's painted in huge block letters on city streets from Washington to Wisconsin. But how would it work? Some who support the idea want to strip all police funding and dissolve entire departments. What, what does that mean? We say abolish the police because we mean abolish the police, right? <laughs> there's, there's no mincing of language there. There's, no, there's nothing that we're trying to trick you on. Um, it, but the thing I think that I, I, where I've come down is just like, who's making the positive uh, argument for the police at this point? And I, and I say that because... Tell me something right now that the police are good at, other than whooping ass. Like, other than doing that, what are they good at? Um, they, they don't prevent murders. They come in and they try to figure out who did the murder afterward. Mm -hmm. And they don't do any of the things that they're sent out to do. Like Patrice is telling us, it's saying, like, we want them to, like, solve homelessness. But it, what that means is just get the homeless people out of the street, right? We want them to solve these mental health crises. What that just means, kill the people that are having mental health breakdowns. None of the things that we, we, we ask them to do, they're good at. And so then we keep giving them lots and lots of money to do those things. Yeah, I think one of the things that people always say when you start talking about abolishing the police or defunding the police is what about murder, right? What about murder? What about rape? People always say to me, well, what if your kid got kidnapped as if that's not something I've worried about every single day as a parent um, my since the day he was born, right? The reality is that the police aren't doing a very good job of handling those situations, right? And that when we picture accountability in this country, we're relying on a violent system 
to reduce violence, right? We're relying on a cruel system to reduce cruelty. And we are funding the back end of, 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 of social ills instead of the front end of addressing them. Cities of Eugene and Springfield, Oregon have a service which does just that. It's called cahoots. In some instances, instead of police, dispatchers in Eugene and Springfield send out cahoots teams, two civilians in each, a medic and a trained crisis worker, to respond to what they call non-criminal calls. We can respond for welfare checks. We can check on folks who maybe need some mediation if there's an argument. We can de-escalate. Um, if someone is in a neighborhood kind of just acting odd, we can just check on them and make sure they don't need anything. Ebony Morgan says Cahoots helped more than 20,000 people in those situations last year alone with their non-combative, unarmed approach. I've seen police presence agitate some folks and they get a little more intense for whatever their experience has been. When they see us, they know that we're just there to talk and if they tell us to leave, we'll leave. Some police advocates say that approach simply doesn't work when you're walking up to a potentially dangerous domestic dispute. To think that you are going to send an unarmed therapist or social worker to the scene of a domestic dispute where somebody has beaten up their partner, shot their partner, or committed some act of violence against them, and you think that you're going to send somebody there without the required equipment to protect themselves and the innocent person that they're responding help that's folly advocates for defunding police say that money can be used to pay for schools hospitals housing and mental health services in poorer marginalized communities let's see what life looks like without police in seattle anna warner has more on the city's response to the protests mayor jenny durkin fired back at president trump's warning that he would send in troops to seattle the threat to invade Seattle, to divide and incite violence in our city, is not only unwelcome, it would be illegal. Still, the president continued his complaints. If we have to go in, we're going to go in. These people are not going to occupy a major portion of a great city. After multiple nights of violent clashes, police, in a show of de-escalating tensions in the Capitol Hill district, boarded up their station and left. Now the area, called the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, or CHAZ, is being controlled by mostly peaceful protesters. Activists have camped out, vowing to stay unless their demands, which include defunding the police and racial equality, are met. In a video message, Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best said she did not order officers and personnel to abandon the city's east precinct after several days of unrest. Ultimately, the city had other plans for the building and relented to severe public pressure. We're going to evaluate and see if what the viability is of um, bringing officers in, uh, but certainly there's no plan to do that right at this moment. The autonomous zone is turned into an almost street fair-like atmosphere with free food, art displays, and outdoor movie nights. But there have been some reports of armed people patrolling the streets in lieu of police. Demonstrators have renamed the building the Seattle People's Department. This also is our building, as we paid for this, and we paid for their works, and everything that they do is supposed to benefit the people. And many say they have no plans to leave. We're not stopping these guys from going to work, but we will occupy the space for the best of our ability, utilizing our rights. So maybe everything is fine. Maybe it's perfectly fine to have, you know, no police and just peaceful protesters everywhere, right? The rioting can stop, the burning can stop, the smashing can stop, but when does the brutality against our fellow Americans, against the constitutionalized racism stop? We want equality! The real equality! I'm, I'm here to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else. Elijah Cummins and Donald Trump were beefing back and forth. They showed all these politicians, but they didn't show regular people. They didn't have an input. They should have showed them and asked them what they thought and how things are. And then I think it would have shut everybody up. 
We are here inside of the 7th Congressional District of Maryland today. Why are we here? Well, the president has criticized this district as being a bad place to live and having a lot of problems. The left has come to the defense and said that this is a great place to live and the president is racist. So what's the truth? We're here to ask the only people that matter, the actual residents of Maryland's 7th District. Benny on the block, let's go ask. Palestine, how long have you lived in this area? 60 years in this block. Yeah, I've lived in Baltimore actually all my life. All my life. Lifelong resident. You seem like a guy who loves Maryland. Is this home for you? Yeah, I've grown up here my whole life. You love the city? Of course. Hey, I haven't been other places, but I prefer here. I've been born and raised in Baltimore all my life. I do a lot of work down here in the city, so I see a lot of the ups and downs of the city. The president tweeted that it was rat infested. I mean, is that true? Are there rats here? Yes. There's rats here everywhere. Oh, there's rats. God knows there's rats. Yes, they are. Um, there is a rat problem. The stuff that's in the news is basically true. Rat infested, you know? We have rats, but of course that's going to come with trash. There's quite a few rats, though. The city gave everybody nice, great big trash cans. Why don't you use them? Everybody need to do that instead of just throwing it where they want to. Use the trash can, put the trash in. You hear a lot about there being a trash problem and a rat problem here today. We've talked with a lot of residents about the trash problem and about the rat problem. The people who live here tell us that that absolutely is true. And as you walk down the street, it's evident that there are just piles of garbage everywhere uh, that you look. The city hasn't always been bad. It's going downhill because Lack of jobs, lack of housing. And you see all these just abandoned homes all down all down the sidewalk here. You got a lot of boarded up houses. The city has already said they're not going to put any work into them. They're not going to develop them. So they're just sitting here. Not a single inhabited home. And we're on an entire city block here, both sides. You can look up and down both sides of the block. Not a single home is inhabited. Due to the takeover, officers can no longer respond to all calls for violent crimes in the neighborhood. We have heard that there are armed people patrolling the streets near 12th and Pine. President Trump dubbing the group domestic terrorists, despite the gathering being largely peaceful. He called on the governor and mayor to take back your city now. If you don't do it, I will. Seattle's mayor firing back on Twitter, writing, make us all safe. Go back to your bunker. It is unconstitutional and illegal to send military to Seattle. And slamming the president's threat to move in on the city. One of the things this president will never understand is that listening to community is not a weakness. It is a strength. But the mayor taking criticism herself from some Black Lives Matter protesters, saying she's allowing this to distract from the overall cause. I'm ashamed of my city right now. I'm ashamed of the mayor. Ashamed of Shame your... on her. And I don't know how it, how Capitol Hill became the center focus of this. Capitol Hill is not the black community. The black community is six blocks up the street and to the left. Those at the autonomous zone have a list of demands, including removing officers from schools, getting rid of juvenile jails, and even abolishing the city's police department altogether. Biden has now become ultimately the front man for an agenda that he neither controls. I'm not even sure if he's aware what that uh, agenda is. Um, he's the Pied Piper of a movement that's actually pushing him forward. He's not leading anyone. Um, ironically, behind this whole critique, this larger critique of America as a racist society, uh, uh, the structural racism, institutional racism, and so on, uh, the one thing that never gets mentioned is the culpability of the Democrats. Party and Biden's actually been a part of this uh, in actually creating this sort of racist past, this racist history. This was, in fact, the party of slavery, of the slave plantation, the party that precipitated the Civil War, opposed the Civil Rights Amendments, established segregation in every southern state, created and then later revived the Klan. So it's rather remarkable that these sort of racial arsonists, if you will, are now showing up pretending to be firefighters, taking no responsibility for what their party did and trying to pin the blame on Republicans, on Americans, and everybody except themselves. This is the screen grab video going around the world right now about what actually happens when you go to the Black Lives Matter website to donate to Black Lives Matter. Now, 
I, along with so many other people, have come under fire in the past couple, I don't know, two weeks, because I don't have a problem per se with the phrase Black Lives Matter. Of course Black Lives Matter, just like all lives matter, or I like the phrase American Lives Matter a lot better. But I have a huge problem with Black Lives Matter, the organization. And here's why. If you look over here at the screen grab, you'll know what I'm saying is true. When you click on the Black Lives Matter website, you will see that they actually don't identify themselves as a charity organization. They identify as a full-fledged uh, corporation at this point. Where were they formed? Where are the articles of incorporation? What city, what state does this corporation operate out of? It's a very interesting question, but that's not the crazy part. For so I just dropped my paper. I have a little notes here so I don't get it wrong. The crazy part is there's been talk for forever that the Black Lives Matter organization is nothing more than a Democratic run establishment to try to continue the, the Democratic movement. Now, why do we say this? If you'll notice in this screenshot right here, when you click on donate to Black Lives Matter, it automatically takes you to a secure Act Blue website. Now, what is Act Blue? Act Blue is a charity 501c3 organization, okay? Now, on the surface, that doesn't look bad, but if you look at what it says, and if you look, when you click on their top donations, you find out that any money that is not claimed, that is donated to Act Blue, they get to distribute it however they want to distribute it. What are their top things that they donate their money to, you might ask? Don't worry. I have a list. Uh, the number one is Bernie 2020 for $186 million. What's the number two, you might ask? <gasps> Biden for president at $119 million. Hold on, we're not done. Uh, number three, Warren Presidential Exploratory Committee, $93 million. Hold on, we're not done. Democratic Congressional Campaign, $55 million. Democratic Senatorial Committee, $31 million. And the Democratic National Committee, $29 million. Yes, it's true that you know having a use of force policy that bans things like chokeholds uh, and strangleholds uh, or you know makes deadly force a last resort rather than a first resort, yes, that can reduce police killings. Um, but ultimately, the goal should be ending police violence in its entirety. Uh, and we recognize that. I think the best strategy to do that is to be supporting the work that's happening on the ground and shifting those resources away from police and into community-based alternatives. 375 million interactions with the public every year. 375 million interactions. Overwhelmingly positive responses overwhelmingly positive responses but i read in the papers all week we all read in the papers that in the black community mothers are worried about their children getting home from school without being killed by a cop what world are we living in that doesn't happen it does not happen i am not derek siobhan they are not him he killed someone. We didn't. We are restrained. And you know what? I'm saying this to all the cops here. Because you know what? Everybody's trying to shame us. The legislators. The press. Everybody's trying to shame us into being embarrassed about our profession. But you know what? This isn't stained by someone in Minneapolis. It's still got a shine on it. And so did theirs. So do theirs. Stop treating us like animals and thugs and start treating us with some respect. That's what we're here today to say. We've been left out of the conversation. We've been vilified. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Trying to make us embarrassed of our profession. 375 million interactions overwhelmingly overwhelmingly positive nobody talks about all the police officers that were killed in the last week in the united states of america and there were a number of them 
There have been 22 officers shot in the last week. At least three have been killed. One is on life support. Thousands of others assaulted, harassed, and demonized. You don't know their names. You wouldn't recognize their faces. And you almost certainly won't post a box or a hashtag in their honor or memory, but they are mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, husbands, and wives. They stand in the gap for you, for me, for those who hate them and don't care about their lives simply because they wear that badge. They are the thin blue line, and these are my final thoughts dedicated to them. Dave Patrick Underwood, David Dorn, and Shay McAlonis. Do their names sound familiar? Probably not, and understandably so, because they've received scant media coverage and zero protests or riots have been ignited in their name. One is currently fighting for his life, and the other two have paid the ultimate price as a result of the madness, chaos, lawlessness, and despicable behavior that's consumed our nation over the last five days. And just last night, we added another name to the list, Moody, Alabama Sergeant Stephen Williams. He was shot dead last night, responding to a disturbance call from a Motel 8. Not only was he a 23-year veteran of law enforcement, but also part of the organization Humanizing the Badge, which is dedicated to bettering police and community relationships. He was a hero, a good cop, a good man. He gave his life, protecting and serving, and he's not the only one. Dave Patrick Underwood, 53, was a federal officer. He was gunned down, shot, and killed providing security at the U.S. courthouse in Oakland. Yes, he was an innocent black man who was gunned down and killed for no reason, but there was no significant national outrage or outcry following his death. Why? David Dorn, 77, was a retired St. Louis police captain. He was shot and killed outside of a looted pawn shop. He was killed trying to stop the looting of that pawn shop. Yes, he was an innocent black man who was gunned down and killed for no reason, but again, there was no significant national outrage or outcry following his death. Why? Shane McAlone is 29 is in critical condition after he was shot execution style in the back of the head while arresting a protester in Las Vegas Monday night. All three of these brave men were senselessly attacked. For what? In the name of justice for George Floyd? No, that cannot be the case. To those in the movement, is this the justice you're looking for? A nationwide war on cops? Because the writing is on the wall. After all the stores have been looted, all the windows smashed, what will the protesters, looters, and rioters turn to next? Well, I can tell you, because sadly we've seen it just four years ago. Not even four years ago, on July 7th, 2016, five officers were ambushed and shot to death in the Dallas massacre during a BLM protest, wherein the shooter set out to kill white cops to avenge the death of Alton Sterling. Then just after that, on July 17th in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, six officers were shot, three fatally. One of them was again an innocent black man, but the BLM movement did not activate on his behalf. Did his life of service and sacrifice not matter? This is what happens when anger and hatred overcome reason and logic. That is what happens when you blame all officers for the actions of a few bad apples. You get a war on cops. I want to begin by stating that the prospect of defunding and or dismantling police forces across the country is one of the most unwise, irresponsible proposals by American politicians in our nation's history and makes absolutely no sense at all, at least to me. I believe it is nothing short of the politicizing of current social events and the effort to garner votes during this election season. I also believe that it's a reactionary measure that can and will result in short and long-term damage to American society, particularly in our inner city and urban communities. Now, I recognize the fact that the elimination of excessive force and physical retaliation by officers of the law against American citizens is paramount today. I recognize the fact that racial profiling and the harsh treatment of minorities is a very real reality that must be eliminated immediately. I myself can testify of times in my life when I felt racially profiled by police. I can testify of times in my life when I was pulled over for driving while black. I can testify of giving my grandson, who is now of driving age, the talk of how to properly behave if pulled over by police because, because he had the question of a very real fear of the possibility of death at the hands of police. In fact, my very first interaction with police when I was 13 years old resulted in me being roughed up. I could very easily have been George Floyd. George Floyd could have very easily been me, my brothers, my friends, or any number of any other black men in America. However, 
I do not recommend throwing the baby out with the bathwater by labeling all police officers as bad cops simply because of the bad actions of a rogue segment of those whose job is supposed to be to protect and to serve American citizens. In fact, in certain inner city communities across America, increased funding for police and increased police presence is actually necessary in order to enforce the law and to guarantee the safety and the security of law-abiding members of those communities. I chose to give both sides of the story so that you can choose what you want to vote for and what you want to follow. I don't think abolishing the police will solve any problems of violence, but I do acknowledge that there are restraints and chokeholds and things that that need to be fixed. Um, for my city in particular, I know that we do not have enough police funding. So the outcry that the police are so overfunded is not true in all communities, although it may be true in some. I think it's time for politicians to reevaluate what's going on in their cities and how they can best serve the people. Abolishing the police completely, in my opinion, is not the correct answer. People need to be protected. I think anarchy is not the right way to go, but we should definitely hear out the Black Lives Movement, although since I am not supporting the left side, I am not going to donate to the movement because their money is going to the politicians, unfortunately.